I'm Nolan Gray, your friendly neighborhood city planner, research director at California Yimby, and one of the co-leads of the new Metropolitan Abundance Project. Welcome back to the Abundance Podcast. This week, Ned Resnikoff and I chat with Megan Kimball. Megan is an investigative journalist and the author of Unprocessed. She's a former executive editor at the Texas Observer and has written about housing, transportation, and urban development for the New York Times, Texas Monthly, The Guardian, and Bloomberg City Lab. She lives in Austin, Texas. In this episode, we chat about her brand new book, where I have it over here, City Limits, Infrastructure, Inequality, and the Future of America's Highways. Uh, It's an incredible conversation, and I'll tell you, I really, really enjoyed the book, so do go purchase it at local booksellers nationwide. Uh, We chat about highway removal and some of the other factors at play. Um, A few things here. First, uh, this episode, as well as the previous episode we recorded with Stan Eklobzia, we have transcripts on the website. So you can watch videos, you can listen to it over a podcast, or you can read the transcript. It's great if you want to search for something in particular that we talked about. That's over at our brand new website, metroabundance.org. That's metroabundance.org. You can also find us at Metro Abundance on uh, Twitter and or X, uh, Instagram, uh, most major uh, platforms. And if we're not on the platform you want us to be on, let us know. How do you let us know? Leave a like, comment, subscribe, leave a review. Uh, Let us know what you like about the podcast, what you don't like, anything that helps the uh, algorithm uh, bump us up a little bit more. We very much appreciate. Let us know who you want to hear from in future episodes, and we'll do our best. Okay, I think I've talked more than enough. With that, onto the show. Hi, Megan. Thanks for joining the Abundance Podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I think Ned and I both finished your book over the weekend. Uh, I was reading it on a work trip in Tucson. Uh, and it's the type of book that uh, uh, makes you mad and inspires you page to page. Uh, it's so chock full of little moments where you're like, how could this be happening? Um, and so, uh, yeah. Big picture. I mean, it, when you're confronting something like urban freeway removal, I mean, how do you keep your sanity and in, in like this policy space where it just seems totally insane? I mean, I'm always motivated as a journalist by big intractable problems. Like that is really interesting and motivating to me. Uh, my first book was about the food system. So I don't know. I'm like interested in problems that no one thinks about. Like in a lot of Texas and for a lot of Texas history, no one bothered to like fight TxDOT. No one bothered to challenge their authority or say, Hey, we want something different. Um, so it is like, it's so obviously has all like, there's so many enormous costs to the way that we are building transportation in the state of Texas. And so like that really animates me like that. I couldn't live in Texas if I wasn't animated by, you know, doing things against all evidence and reason. Um, I will say also like the activists who I spent four years profiling, give me a lot of energy because they are making change. Like I can see it and it's, um, it's a big problem, so it's going to take a long time to really like change the course. But I, you know, I have seen changes happen in the four years that I've been reporting this book. Yeah, so I mean, I think one way to understand kind of the craziness of the status quo that you do really effectively is the first few chapters of the book are really kind of explaining how we got here, right? Um, you know, I, I grew up in Lexington, Kentucky, blocks away from I seventy five. So when when you're interviewing people and they're talking about like, you just get used to the hum of the freeway. Uh, I totally sympathize with that. Like I actually, it's almost like ocean waves in the background to me now, which like knowing what I do now about like air pollution and respiratory health, uh, I'm a little bit more concerned, but I mean, something that I think you capture is just the sheer, just the sheer scale of the removals that were associated with some of these initial urban freeways. Um, You know, many thousands of homes being built, well, how could I'm reading that and I'm thinking there's no way how could that ever happen today? Of course, your book, the rest of your book is about, hey, yeah, it's still happening today. But uh, help me understand that that mindset that folks were in when we were first really just building all of this urban infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, these highways were sold as progress in the book. I really try to have empathy for the planners and kind of people of the 1940s and 50s when cars were becoming ascendant and like the kind of origins of the interstate highway program started. And so the book begins in Highways and Horizons, which is like this exhibit, somewhat famous exhibit at the 1939 World's Fair, sponsored by General Motors as a way to sell more cars. But the way they did that is like to sell the future, like a car centric future where everyone could get where they wanted, whenever they wanted to go there. You know, they would have autonomy and independence. They could get outside of these like crowded, disease ridden cities and, you know, prosper and spread out on their own acre of land, which is like a vision that Frank Lloyd Wright published. And so like, it's totally understandable that people flocked to buy these cars and that planners sort of flocked to accommodate them because like the car was this like, offered this vision of a technological future. Like 
the the kind of uh, vision of highways and horizons is these like wide broad highways like clean concrete gleaming skyscrapers it was like a vision of technological progress and you know the people who rallied behind that were in part people who stood to profit off of it so like car companies and cement companies and all the people who were gonna you know oil companies um there was a massive profit profit machine behind it but i do kind of empathize with those kind of people of the planners of the 1940s and 50s who saw the car as this like great promise for the american city so eisenhower passes the interstate highway act in 1956 and the promise of that act was actually to like connect the country um so he really conceived of it as the national defense act and it's called the national defense highway act um but like in implementing that planners started routing highways right through the middle of cities very much against eisenhower's wishes and i can tell that story if you want later but like um you know planners saw all these people moving to the suburbs there were like cars just flooding city streets and so there was this urgency to like do something about traffic congestion like in in dallas i found this video that's like it was so not subtle it says something to the effect of like you know traffic is the lifeblood of our city like slow that lifeblood and our city dies you know these are like really strong words about we have to accommodate the free flow of cars and that belief persists today um, this idea that like ca- car travel and enabling seamless car travel will create economic prosperity. That the origins of that idea are the 1940s and 50s. Yeah, it's remarkable. I, I read this concurrently with starting Fallout on uh, Amazon Prime, uh, which uh, if you haven't already, you should check it out. But a kind of a minor spoiler, like a premise of the show is that a like vault company had a financial interest in perpetuating nuclear war and i'm i'm watching it and then reading your book about like oh we have to build this national freeway system in light of this like existential threat of like you know nuclear annihilation and all of these these sort of this lost history of like we need to build the freeway so we can evacuate our cities if, if and when we get nuked and you're just it, it's it's almost like reading sci-fi right like within our own past like this completely different like mindset and like set of concerns that folks had Yeah, but I will say, like, the book very intentionally does not target, like, interstate highways in the sense that we think of them, like, connecting Austin to Houston or connecting L.A. to Houston. Like, those highways really, truly did open up the country. They enabled the great migration of black people from the south to the north. They enabled, like, people to move across the country. Like, we became a much more mobile society as like as a result of these highways. And, like, we also had a lot more, like, economic trade. So, like, in California lots of produce come from there you can ship it to minnesota all of a sudden and those strawberries will still arrive fresh so there's like that's a different i think a little bit of a different story of the story of like these interstate highways spread across our country what i really wanted to focus on in the book is like these massive highways that went right through the middle of our cities demolishing neighborhoods um creating air pollution right where people live and like even at the time even in 1956 and 1960 Eisenhower and this guy, John Bragdon, who he appointed to oversee the implementation of the Interstate Highway Program, were like, this is a bad idea. We do not want these highways to go through the middle of cities. Building highways in the middle of cities will not fix the problem they're promising to solve, which is urban congestion. Like, it seemed it was already a bad idea at the time. And yet here we are, 70 years later, like, spending billions of dollars to sort of double and triple down on that bad idea. The story about Eisenhower was one of a, a few truly draw, jaw-dropping moments in the book. And uh, I'm, I'm a former journalist, so I'm going to ask some craft questions that hopefully won't be too tedious to listeners who are just here for the housing and transportation policy. But I, I was wondering if you could tell the story a bit of how you how you unearthed that, that memo that, that really kind of demonstrated that this was all happening against the express wishes of the Eisenhower administration and against the intent of the legislation. Yeah, I love talking reporting, so I can go on about this. Uh, but yeah, I had seen a memo. It's like somewhat famous in the transit highway advocate community. So a, a urban planner in Dallas named Patrick Kennedy, who's profiled in the book, he shared this memo with me. And in it, it's basically Eisenhower's response to a presentation that he receives in the spring of 1960, saying that the ma- the manner of running the interstate routes through the congested part of his cities was against his wishes. And that's all I had. It's like two paragraphs in this memo, but it really kind of like hints at a larger story, which is like, okay, Eisenhower didn't want freeways to be built through the middle of cities. And yet here we are with freeways through every American city. 
And so I actually went to the Eisenhower Presidential Library, which is in Abilene, Kansas. So I drove like 10 miles from 10 hours from Austin, where I live, really kind of on like a fishing expedition. Like I had no idea what I would find. I, I like requested a bunch of records in advance of my visit, but I showed up the first morning and there's like two giant carts full of archives. And I just started leafing through them. And what I found was this incredible story of this guy, John Bragdon. So he was, he served in the army with uh, Eisenhower. There were like old friends and he's an engineer. He had supervised construction for the army during uh, World War One and Two. And, and Eisenhower basically appoints him to oversee the implementation of the Interstate Highway Program. So the Bureau of Public Roads is the agency responsible for distributing, you know, the $25 billion enabled by this program. Eisenhower's like, hey, we need someone to oversee this implementation. By 1960, the Interstate Highway Program is running significantly over budget. It's a $25 billion program. And Bragdon finds when he looks into it that it's running $11 billion over budget. And he's like, why? And the reason is that cities are taking this like liberal federal funding. So the federal government had agreed to pay 90% of the cost of construction of highways, which before they had only paid up to 50%. So there's lots of federal money going to states and cities and almost no strings attached. And so what cities are doing is they are taking that money. Again, like we talked about, cars are flooding city streets. There's like paralyzing congestion on these old roads. And so states are just planning and building massive urban highways. Urban highways are much more expensive to build than rural highways. You know, you have to buy right of way. It's a much trickier engineering challenge because there are existing buildings there. And so as a result, the program is running significantly over budget. And so Bragdon kind of asked Congress to, or he asked the Department of Commerce to look into the kind of intent of Congress in passing the interstate highway program. Like, did Congress intend for federal money to be spent using, to be spent building routes through urban areas? And Congress produces this, or I'm sorry, the Department of Commerce produces this report called the like legislative intent with respect to designating ur- interstate highways in urban areas. It's a super wonky title, but I found that and I was like, oh, this is it, right? This is the story. In this report, the Department of Commerce makes clear that Congress's intent was not to build highways through urban areas. So Bragdon takes that and he himself makes his own report that he gives to President Eisenhower, basically looking at the state of the interstate highway program. And I actually found the like text of his presentation to Eisenhower. They're like note cards with his like handwritten notes on them, like cursive. Um, And it's a remarkable presentation. And in it, Bragdon just like lays out arguments that will be familiar to like any transit advocate today, where he says... Cities are using all of this money to build massive roads through their centers. They're destroying housing and they're making kind of like like car centric sprawl. And all of the urban planners say the the way to fix urban congestion is to build transit. But what cities are doing are tearing up that transit and replacing it with roads. And he gives all these examples of of cities across the country that's happening in. And he tells Eisenhower, what you should do is like, direct the Bureau of Public Roads to create more stringent guidance on what states are allowed to do with this money. The intent of the program is like the federal interest is connect the country, connect cities. States are using this money to try to solve this newly created problem, quote unquote, of traffic congestion. And so he gives this, I think, really compelling case of like the way to solve urban congestion is to to build transit, to build and expand transit. Um, and that like cities should not just grow and develop around a highway plan, which is what they're doing now. Like cities should undertake proper urban planning before they get all of this, you know, billions of dollars of money to build highways. And that's what leads to Eisenhower's response, which is, and it's captured in this memorandum of like the manner of building interstate routes through the middle of cities was against his wishes. And those who had implemented the program in such a way had done so against his desires. And that's kind of what I had. And then I was in the library and I was like, I still don't really understand why Eisenhower like didn't do something. If it was against his wishes, like why didn't he direct the Bureau of Public Roads to change course? And I found a note in his his secretary who wrote like daily diaries based on the kind of happenings of the president. And and she writes this note that says like, you know, um, General Parsons, who was like a high up in the Eisenhower administration, were in for like a hearing on the roads program and uh, Bragdon thinks that, you know, the guidance should change, but General Parsons and others think it would be murder to move in an election year. And then I found this, like, article by the engineer, like, an engineering trade publication that basically corroborate that, which is, like, it's an election year. Like, the states would rise up in arms, is what Eisenhower says, if he changed the course of the program, because funding had already been committed. States had been making their plans. Um, he didn't want to, you know, 
agitate swing states. And so he didn't change course. And here we are, you know, in 2024 with massive highways right through the middle of every city. I mean, it's such an amazing story. And I, I also the story about the story because it, it reminds me a lot of, uh, you know, like Robert Cairo digging through the archives of uh, the LBJ library and, you know, doing original reporting on things that happened 50, 60, 70 years ago. But I, I was wondering on the, if we could focus for a, a second on the, um, the local jurisdiction and, and the, uh, the state side of things in this back and forth between Eisenhower and, and the, the locals. I mean, Presumably, they would have gotten some benefit from from using that those highway funds as they were originally intended to. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about why some of these cities and states were bucking the wishes of the president of the United States. I mean, some of them also probably were from the, the same party as Eisenhower, uh, why they were why they were going against his wishes. I mean, I mean, was it. Was it really just that they didn't understand induced demand and they thought that this would relieve congestion or were there other motives at play too? I mean, I think the first thing is like a lot of cities didn't know they were going against Eisenhower's wishes. This meeting was not made public. Bragdon's interim report was not released. Like you had to be paying very close attention to like DC politics to know. I don't know how widely publicized this was in the 60s, but like I don't think that it was commonly reported that Eisenhower didn't want this. Um you know, and this like the growth of highways like parallels the growth of the suburbs because of federal housing policy. So, you know, people, white families specifically, were moving out of the city. They needed to get back uh, to, you know, their jobs downtown. And so there was a demand of like, we need to accommodate more car travel. Um, you know, downtowns were kind of withering. And there was this promise that was sold of like, bringing cars back to our city centers is going to like reinvigorate them. It's like a downtown revitalization program. Um, so there was absolutely like, I think cities saw it as like an economic benefit. Uh, I think lots of evidence shows that has not, <laughs> that didn't work out very well for cities. But like at the time, the way these were sold, you know, I spent a lot of time also just like in local newspaper archives, trying to understand how like reporters, for example, at the Dallas Morning News were covering highway building in the 40s and 50s. And a lot of how these projects were sold was like, yeah, economic development. We're going to bring people from these the kind of growing suburbs north of Dallas back downtown, and that's going to reinvigorate our business district. Um, of course, there was a huge, like you know, profit motive behind all of this. Of like, car companies were agitating to have more roads built because they would fit more cars and sell more gasoline, and so oil companies lined up too. So that they're cohered in the 1940s. This massive, the American Road Builders Association. American Road Builders Association became one of the biggest lobbies in the country. So there certainly was like a huge political lobby um, advocating for this. But I think there was also like planners were selling this as a way for economic development. Something I'd, I'd be curious to hear you discuss a little bit more is um, you talk a little bit about some of the some of the protests against this and then some of the early movements to get rid of freeways, the Embarcadero in San Francisco. I, I'm curious if you have thoughts on you know, freeways weren't built everywhere and sometimes they were stopped, uh, you know, as like an extreme alternative to, I think, what you spend most of the book talking about, which is the Texas context. What, why did, why did that happen? Why, why in some places did urban freeways not successfully get installed? There were popular revolts. So in San Francisco and Baltimore and Seattle, you know, thousands or sometimes tens of thousands of people revolted. You know, they showed up in San Francisco, they protested in Golden Gate Park. In Seattle, they crowded, you know, city council chambers. Um, there was this biracial coalition in Baltimore called Movement Against Destruction. So people organized. And, like, I think where people effectively organized and mobilized tens of thousands of people or just thousands, and particularly combinations of white and black people together, I think you see, like, there was effective resistance. And freeway fighters, you know, erased lines from maps before they could be built. I'm surprised by why does that emerge in some places but not others? You know, like what, like why San Francisco, Baltimore, Portland? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's probably an, an issue that it, like deserves a little bit more investigation. Yeah, I don't know. Actually, it's a great question. Like, why some places were able to stop freeways? 
I think, I mean, one reason then and now is like political leaders began to oppose them. So in San Francisco, you had the political leadership oppose highway plans and they really like didn't buy the narrative of these highways are going to bring progress to your city. I think too, it's like in like in the first cities where highways were built, they really like shocked people. They were like, you know, they're polluting, they're loud, they're so disruptive to the urban environment. And so I think like early on the highway, the, the cities where highways were built, you saw much more opposition because they were just so shocking to communities and people effectively organized. But the highways that were built later and later on, they just were sort of like, there was an inertia behind highway building that I think it was harder for people to organize against. You know, thinking about the the resistance to installing urban freeways, especially in the uh, 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, one thing that came to my mind while I was reading your book was it, it, it felt like there's a very tangled sort of causal history between uh, the fight over freeways and the current housing crisis. And so obviously uh, the installation of these freeways and obliterating entire neighborhoods to make room for them was, a, I think, a really pivotal moment in laying the groundwork for the current housing crisis. And yet at the, at the same time, the resistance to freeways as local as it, as it was does seem like it innovated a lot of the techniques that would then later be used to block housing that's intended to relieve the housing crisis. And there's a there's a I think a, a complicated relationship there too between I think some of the the early activists who were fighting freeway expansion, which is something that I think most pro housing people would really vociferously support, but at the same time how that how that kind of transitioned into a sort of anti apartment building like anti high rise politics down the road. As as just wondering if you could reflect on that on that relationship a little bit and and maybe bringing it up to the present day what you saw among uh anti-freeway actives in terms of their how they think about housing now in these cities yeah that's a great question i mean i think today for sure the like tactics of anti-freeway people of freeway fighters are really similar to the tactics of nimbys which is oppose and delay um, so in Texas, you know, I've reported on several projects that, including I-35 in Austin that were like sued under NEPA or somehow stopped under like a procedural, um, question around the National Environmental Policy Act, which like is also used to stop affordable housing developments and like, um, other kind of pro density work transit included. Um, so like absolutely. Like, and I don't know that I've like reconciled the kind of like philosophical question behind that, which is like. The tactics of these two groups, which are like, I think Yimbies and, and like anti-freeway people have like the Venn diagram is almost a circle. And yet uh, freeway fighters like have to oppose like that is basically their 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 single directive is oppose, stop, resist. I mean, this group in Houston who I profile, they are literally called stop text out I-45. And, you know, I think one reason for that is simply today, like state DOTs have so many resources. And that was true in the 60s. Is like these state DOTs could just wear people out. They could wait them out. They could wear them down. You know, if you didn't want this highway today, well, they'll just come back in seven years and build it when you've moved on. <laughs> like, And there are examples of that time and again across the country. Um, so like, I think oppositional, it's very hard to have a proactive vision or, a, you know, a affirmative vision in that case, um, that freeway fighters are just absolutely outnumbered and outmanned and, you know, outresourced. Yeah, it, it was such a funny book for me because well, I'll say this, look, my very principled stand on this is I support delays in process for things I don't want to happen. Uh, and I oppose them for things that I do want to happen. Like maybe that's the like philosophical <laughs> stance that we could settle on. It, I mean, it was just so funny reading your book. And I'm like rooting like, yes, they discovered a NEPA delay, like, you know, I think it was for the I-45 expansion with Houston, where they they tried to like segment it out, which is a big no-no in environmental review. And I'm like, yes, you know, oh, and he said it on the record that it's one project, you know. And it's just so funny. I think that is kind of what's get, what he's getting at here is that like in the housing sphere, right? These things are like just kind of a big giant headache and a nightmare. Uh, but in, in you know, with with freeways, where it's like actually, you know this probably really is where you want to do a really, really robust environmental review. Uh, and 
Uh, but it, 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 is, it is kind of a funny, I think, situation for somebody who spends all day talking about the need for environmental reform on housing uh, to be feeling. Totally. And that and that's also true with transit, right? Is like transit is very hard and expensive to build. And I've read lots of really excellent reporting about how we should make transit cheaper and quicker to build. I mean, I'm seeing that in Austin right now with Project Connect, which is in the book, this massive transit referendum we passed in 2020. It's keep that it keeps getting delayed, the costs keep going up. And it's like, you know, I feel frustration is like, let's build this quicker. And yet, parallel to that, there are like lots of groups who are just trying to gum up the works on the I-35 project. Um, but again, I do think the difference is TxDOT has its 10 year budget, its last 10 year like uh, budget plan was $110 billion. So I do think there is a little bit of a difference in the sense of like, probably multi billion dollar projects deserve more scrutiny, just like as a rule, mm. I think that's like, I'm okay standing behind that. Yeah, and I was about to say, it's not just that it's a, a multi billion dollar project, but there's just fundamentally a difference between um, I mean, in the actual, like, qu qualitatively and quantitatively in the environmental impacts between we are going to build a 10 unit apartment building in your single family neighborhood on a lot that is currently not utilized versus actually we are going to wipe out every single home in this neighborhood, regardless of whether it is currently occupied or not. Like I can, I can understand the need for additional community input if the question is, not should this neighborhood stay the same forever or not, but just fundamentally, should this neighborhood be inhabitable? Yeah, but and there's also like values embedded in what deserves more scrutiny, right? Like the three of us might agree upon a certain set of values of what deserves more scrutiny, but I think that a lot of leaders in Texas would disagree with that. Like, and, and like, so that's just, a, I, again, I haven't reconciled what is the correct policy and legislative fix for that. But like TxDOT is selling these highways to people who live in the suburbs is like a way to get back to their job in school. A lot of these people have been pushed to the suburbs because of housing policy, because they cannot afford to live in Austin or in Houston or Dallas. And they need access, you know, they need access back to where they live and go to school and where their kids have childcare. Um, and so like that is a real need, right? And they're, and they're selling this as a solution and like, the argument of the book is like rather than build bigger and bigger highways to carry people farther and farther away from the center of a city is like, let's start to bring that closer. Let's build more densely. Let's build transit. But like the way that the built environment currently exists in Texas is like we need those big highways to get people to their jobs. Sure. So, I mean, one of the things that I think is challenging, especially in the Texas context, is that like aff housing affordability in Texas is kind of premised on like endlessly building out, <clears throat> you know, wider and wider freeways into virgin land that we then build new subdivisions on. And I think one of the nuances that you get at in the book is that like, well, hey, you know, like if we if we just scrap this paradigm and don't transition over to something new, you know, that's how are people going to be able to afford to live? Do you want to kind of unpack that trade off a little bit? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people in Texas, it's not just in Texas, it's true across the country, but have, a lot of people where I've reported have moved to the suburbs, not because they want to be there, but because that's the only place they can afford a house. So people are moving farther and farther from the center of Austin, in large part because of our zoning that doesn't, that makes it illegal to build anything more dense than a single family home on most land in the city. That's true in Dallas, you know, they're in the middle of their own zoning fight. So indeed, like what, how we've developed in most Texas cities is that people have sprawled and they rely on these highways to get back to school, to work, to their childcare, whatever they need. Um, and so like, that's kind of what TxDOT is selling is like, we have developed this way in part because of highways, but it's the self-reinforcing cycle that we have these big highways. So the most affordable place for people to move is to Round Rock to, you know, suburbs outside of Austin. Um, but, you know, when, as I was reporting this, I found this study that shows that when you combine housing and transportation costs in a city like Houston, where the median household spends about 20% of their disposable income on transportation. So the median, oh, sorry, when you combine housing and transportation in Houston, it's just as expensive to live in as New York City. And I think that doesn't get factored into the housing affordability conversation. People look at their mortgage payment, they look at their property taxes, and they think, oh, it's cheaper to live in the suburbs. But they don't factor in how much it's going to cost for them to get back to work or back to their kid's school or wherever else they're going in the city. And so like, Indeed, the promise that we've been sold in Texas and the way that TxDOT sells these highways is that they help affordability. Like our mayor, Kirk Watson, basically said that about the I-35 expansion. He said, this will help affordability. And that's the promise is, 
And what he means by that is like, it will help the people who have moved because there's no affordable housing in Austin get back to the things they need. But like, there are so many other costs to that form of development, which of course we can talk about, but I'm sure your listeners are familiar with of like, it's not just a financial cost. Yeah, I mean, on on the subject of where local officials fall into this, I would I would love to talk about um, what was his name? J. Robert Bug. Is mm-hmm. that J. Bruce yeah. Bug? J. Bruce Bug, which is just such an amazing Texas villain name. I mean, it sounds like the name of a corrupt sheriff, you know. But the you you mentioned a couple times in the book that he has this extremely tight relationship with Governor Greg Abbott. And it seems like at certain parts of the book, while you don't say this explicitly, it it certainly seems like he's doing things at the beck and call of Abbott. And it made me think that one of the one of the differences here between something like uh, like TxDOT and the Texas Transportation Commission and the way this works in blue states, where blue states still do a lot of highway expansions, too. But I think the difference is that um, Abbott seems genuinely very engaged on the transportation issue. And so he's he's actually personally trying to expand these freeways, whereas in blue states, the impression I get, um, I mean, certainly with with Caltrans, but I would say also ODOT, which you talk a little bit about in the book, the the Oregon Department of Transportation. You know, you have these you have these blue state governors who are nominally committed to combating climate change and reducing transportation emissions, but they're not actually that engaged on transportation. And so the highway, whatever department has uh, a jurisdiction over highways continues to kind of operate on default and to continue to expand these highways. And I mean, is that is that something that was sort of reflected in your reporting that that in Texas, transportation actually is something that uh, state officials have their have their eyes on? Yeah, absolutely. So Governor Abbott ran for office in 2014, promising to fix traffic in Texas cities. And there's like, I think it's a famous ad. I maybe not lots of people haven't seen it, but there's literally a campaign ad of him in his wheelchair rolling along the shoulder of a Dallas highway. And he says, a guy in a wheelchair can get around faster than traffic in Texas cities. I'm going to run for office. I, I can't do the Texas accent, actually. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> um, you know, he ran for office, like promising to get Texans where they were going. And he since since then, he has said in various venues, you know, like everything we're doing in transportation infrastructure keeps Texas number one in the nation in economic development. So he really believes or, you know, his political stance is that like enabling more transportation, which is to say highways, helps bring businesses and people to Texas. Um, And so he's very involved. Um, You know, he started this program after he got elected called Texas Clear Lanes, which is really like the engine behind a lot of these highway widenings. Um, Its current budget is like $65 billion dollars over the next decade will be spent to widen highways in Texas cities. And all of that is really Abbott's doing, like his sort of belief that this will create more business development and bring population to Texas. Um, and, the, and the state legislature is similarly involved and really road centric. The Associated General Contractors like represents highway builders in Texas and they are a very powerful lobby. You know, They donate through various PACs, millions of dollars to people in statewide office, including Abbott. So there's like, I think that's a factor, absolutely. And you know, it's like a basic political corruption story. But I also think there's like a a stronger, deeper belief that driving creates prosperity. And like, I really try to get at that in the book of like, you know, the central question of like 70 years of evidence shows adding lanes to urban highways doesn't fix traffic. Like, why are we still spending so much public money to do that? And I think it really comes down to this like ideological belief that like driving creates freedom and prosperity. And if people can't choose their form of transportation, it's like freedom of choice somehow then this will like make us all less prosperous and our economy will collapse. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is an interesting challenge, I think, for this policy space, right? There's kind of this like folk theory around like, and it, I think it's pretty intuitive, right? Like, okay, traffic's bad. Add another lane of traffic. Uh, that'll address the issue. Of course, I think you, you do a really good job of explaining induced demand and um, all the evidence for that. I, I'm curious, having been working on this issue for a while, have you found a way that like, that, that where the light bulb, goes off where people are like, oh, okay, maybe the extra lanes don't work. I'm 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 sitting here uh here in Los Angeles, um, you know, at the intersection of two major freeways. So again, very this work is extremely relevant to me. Uh right. But there, of course there was a folks familiar with LA will know that they widened the 405, I 405 through the Sepulveda Pass. And then the day it opens, 
congestion on the 405 is uh, worse, right? That's that's been helpful to kind of explain this issue. But and your work on this, you know, what what like what makes it click for people other than just like I live, you know, the people who live near the freeway, right? I think they're concerned with the freeway widening and the existence of a freeway makes sense. But how do you help it make sense for folks who are like, yeah, I commute on the freeway and I want the traffic to go away? Why wouldn't I want to widen it? Well, you mentioned the 405, which like I think a lot of people have ex direct experience with induced demand. So I went door to door with StopTech Side I-45 in Houston, and Houston has the you know the most famous example of induced demand in the world, the Katy Freeway, which text out widened to nearly 26 lanes, and within five years, rush hour traffic had gotten significantly worse. A lot of people in Houston like drove on that freeway. They know that freeway. They either have heard of it or they just like have personal experience with it. So I was actually kind of struck going door to door, like often in low income, you know, Spanish speaking neighborhoods of like how many people actually understand, they don't call it induced demand, but a lot of people just like kind of know the rough idea of like, well, we keep the highways always under construction, traffic isn't getting better. Um, so there's that. I also think people who've never heard of it, like you sort of, I always talk about it as like supply and demand, like you make a good, cheaper and easier for people to access, more people access it. And when you like frame it in that way of just like, this is basic supply and de demand economics. A lot of people have a good, pretty good grasp of that. I do think people understand it. I think the the rub that I have found in a place like Texas is like, well, what do we do instead, right? We have built these massive sprawling cities where people have to drive to get where they're going. Like, what's the alternative? And I think a lot of people actually do understand induced demand, but they're like, they throw their hands up. They're like, I still commute 30 miles to work. Like make that highway better. Just like make it work better. I don't really care how you do it. Make it work better. So we're having this conversation coincidentally on Earth Day. And <laughs> one of the things, I mean, one of the truly eye-popping things in your, in your book is a statistic that Texas transportation emissions account for one half of a percent of I think it was all CO2 in the entire the entire planet, which is just absolutely, or all human produced CO2, which is just absolutely staggering statistic. And you 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 talked a little bit already about this um, this sort of ideology of the car and the sort of supremacy of the of the car. It it does seem that the car does factor into almost like Texas's self mythology in a way that you don't necessarily see in other parts of the country. Although I would actually say that um, California, I mean, not to make this like a red state versus blue state thing, like the mythology of the of the car in, in California is also is also huge, which I think I think you grew up in LA, so you're probably very familiar with. And part of what I'm part of what I'm trying to figure out is not just how to get people to understand induced demand, but also what what sort of messages might be effective for trying to help people understand it doesn't have to be like this like actually your your car is not the same thing as your freedom and there are uh, significant ways in which car dependency actually makes you considerably less free yeah i don't know i mean i think actually it's not distinct to texas and california i think it's like pretty uniquely american even you know there are very few exceptions to the rule which are like dc boston new york like the cities where you can feasibly live without a car every other place you have to basically have to have a car to get access to work or school or a grocery store like it is not unique to these massive freeway cities like houston or la um so i think like it is a kind of an american thing we have to you know, that, that needs to be contested. Um, and I think a lot of it is like, people don't see another way. So like creating, like, it's literally just like you, like you have to build it, right? And like, it's easy for me to say I'm a journalist, like I don't have to be in the policy space, but I think it's like, until transit is a viable alternative for people, or they see a, a pathway for it to become a viable alternative, or until living closer to school or work is a viable pathway for people. People are going to continue to demand car infrastructure because like, it's not like, I, I do think it's, there is a mythos of freedom and individualism, but it's also like basic survival, right? Like you, I talked to people, for example, in South Dallas, which is, so in Dallas, the portion of the book that takes place there chronicles this decade long effort to remove a section of highway called I-345, which is this elevated highway that bounds the Eastern edge of downtown Dallas. 
And, you know, all of that land, it's like it occupies or influences like 250 acres of land. You could build a lot of housing on that land. Um, but I think like people in South Dallas are like, well, that's neat, but like I use that highway to get to work today. Uh, Dallas has been segregated. So all of the jobs are in North Dallas. A lot of low income people live in South Dallas. And so I talked to person after person who's like, that sounds like a neat idea, but like, how am I going to get to work? That's going to make my job harder today. And I think like, there are lots of, of good kind of like higher level arguments for like, how do you move a city away from car dependency? Car dependency is prohibitively expensive for low income populations. It has like a disproportionate burden on low income populations. But I kind of think it's like, it really falls to transit systems and like the fight to get more money to transit systems so that buses come more frequently um, so that they are more reliable. And so that it just like becomes a, a, a thing that people feel like they can use. And that's going to happen somewhat gradually, but I do think it's like making the bus work better. Yeah. I mean, an interesting example of that here in LA was the recent push to try to remove the Marina freeway. It's kind of this weird stub that extends out from the 405 was originally supposed to go, uh, all the way to Slauson, uh, right up, right across Slauson, <clears throat> right through South LA to the 110. But that was part of the pushback was like, well, this is, you know, this is part of a like connection of roads that gets people from predominantly black and Hispanic parts of the city to the beach. And there's no transit alternative. Uh, you only can get there by driving. And I, I think you're very measured on that in the book of like, this transition is hard. And the answer can't just be, we'll just remove the freeway and we'll deal with the other stuff down the line. Totally. Like, I mean, people need to get to work tomorrow. Oh, you know, and I think it's it's like easy to talk about urban planning and like all this affordable housing we're going to build. But I also encountered people who are like, I don't believe the city is going to do that. Like particularly low income black populations in Dallas have very rarely been served by their city government. So you get to a much harder problem, which is like democracy. Like they don't feel represented. They don't feel like their elected representatives are trying to help them in their communities. So like why would removing this highway help them too? Even if it's sold as this kind of reparative justice action, I think a lot of people feel distressful that the city will follow through on its promises. And that gets to write like a, a, a deeper problem of we have just abandoned a lot of low income black communities across this country for decades. And like, why would they trust that a highway removal would help them? I think another thing that you capture really effectively in the book is that there are better and worse ways <laughs> to remove freeways. Uh, you know, I, I also lived in New York City and um <clears throat> famously the, the west side highway was removed and now it's a giant boulevard that it's not obvious to me that it's a dramatic improvement over what was there of course it was removed far you know before i was even born but you know now it's just kind of a big unpleasant high speed six lane boulevard and i think you 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 talk about that in the book and i think it, the, you also talk about rochester i think which is a, maybe a uniquely outstanding example on highway removal do you want to maybe think about like what what, what what principles would you think like would go into freeway removal to make it more enriching than you know just okay we now we just have a thing that's kind of sort of like a freeway but uh not actually like grade separated <laughs> yeah i mean to me the like biggest if you if i had to pick a metric on what makes a highway removal successful is like how much land does it free up like land is the fundamental uh, like factor the like opportunity here. Like our highways take up so much space and land, our cars, like our car infrastructure takes up so much land in our cities. And that land could be used for other things. It could be used for housing, market rate or affordable. Like there are so many ways we could deploy that land to benefit cities. It could be returned to property tax rolls in cities that really need property tax revenue. Um, so I guess like the first thing is like, if it just takes an elevated highway and makes it like a, at grade street with not any kind of land liberty <laughs> for lack of a better word like if it doesn't actually change the land calculation i think that's not that successful because i think the idea is like put it to some other use besides car infrastructure and that could be a dedicated bus lane like it absolutely could be pedestrian and a big wide cycling path whatever it doesn't necessarily have to be housing but it's like if you're just replacing one for one and it just looks different to me that's not really very effective I also think it like we it gets into this like thornier question of like, um, like sort of public participation. Like, so so in Rochester, I, I chronicle the um, inner loop removal, which is this like moat, this trenched highway that circled downtown. And in 2017, the city of Rochester filled it up, um, it brought it to grade, and built like a kind of a two lane 
city street in its place and used the surplus land to build a bike lane and sidewalk and then like three story apartment buildings. And there, it's really remarkable. It's very cool to see. It's like, it's just really good urban planning. It's like a really beautiful street, really beautiful bike lane. And then these like these apartment complexes and I think half of them are rented to families earning below the median income. So like it genuinely created a lot of affordable housing. But people in Rochester who I, so I went there and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is beautiful. What a cool thing. I'm like standing on land that used to be a highway. I like interviewed people who live in those apartment complexes, who live in a place that used to be a highway. Walking around it is just like so cool. But I also talked to a lot of people who were like pretty unhappy with that because they were like, the city just did what the city wanted to do. Like no one asked us. Like it's sort of being sold as this, like we're going to repair the harm done by this urban highway, but like no one engaged me and like my community was harmed when this highway went in. And so the city, the city of Rochester is now like grappling with, or they're now progressing on removing the inner loop north, which is the like the rest of that inner loop. And that highway cut through a, like a mixed income, mixed race a neighborhood called Market View Heights. And there are still people who live in Market View Heights who remember what that neighborhood was like before the highway was built. And they remember the single family homes that were there, you know, like what the, it was like to live in that neighborhood. There were like, stores and markets and you know laundry shops and all that and they're like we want that back you know we want our neighborhood back and the city of Rochester I think to its credit is really trying to authentically grapple with like how do we do that how do we actually build single family homes that are affordable to a family making 50,000 a year um or 30,000 a year um like how do we actually do that in practice but you know I talked to people there who were like you know, I don't, I don't buy that this is going to be better. Like they remember when planners came in and said, Hey, we're going to build this beautiful highway and it's going to make your life so much better. And now, you know, they, they, their parents receive that wisdom and they're just like now they're same age. And they're like, well, well, how will removing that highway make my life better? So I think you get to this like interesting question of like going back to the conversation around like, and I think in the housing space, it's like, too much public participation is not great. I think to vastly oversimplify public, like the kind of reliance on public participation has allowed nimbyism to grow and thrive, right? That like people feel like they have the the authority to say, I don't want this apartment complex down the street for me. And like, I get to say that. And so I think there's been this move to like, how do you streamline? How do you get states to, to um, pass rezonings? But I think in the transportation space, it's like for so long, communities have just been paved over with basically no input. How do you give them authentic participation in the process, particularly when it comes to a removal, when the, the that project is being sold as a way to benefit those populations? Like they have to be a part of that conversation. And like, how do you do that? And th that's the question Like, I don't know that anyone has fully figured that out. Yeah, I mean, it, it's also, Rochester is an interesting example because if you compare it to a city like, for example, Houston, I mean, my understanding is that the population of Rochester is declining and has declined pretty significantly since the the 1970s. And so it seems like when you when you think about what should replace a highway, it it's sort of a very different question because you're not thinking about, well, how do we accommodate this influx of new residents? It's more about how do we uh, economically develop this area that is now fairly distressed? But it's like whichever whichever question you're trying to answer, the highway is not the answer because it's like the the least efficient way, the the least beneficial way you could possibly use that land. And so in the case of, I mean, you know, it's I, I had again one of these kind of funny mixed reactions reading the chapter on on Rochester because at first I I was like, wait a minute, they want to replace this with single family homes? No, but I mean that actually. There's, it's not like there's a massive demand for housing in Rochester. So that's that's fine. And if you have single family homes interspersed with uh, you know, grocery stores, and I think you were saying this was originally kind of a mixed use neighborhood, that mm -hmm. is that is still way more environmentally beneficial than even just replacing the freeway with a four lane or six whip lane boulevard. Reporting in Rochester was interesting for me having like, I've reported on housing quite a bit in Austin and like the frenzy and the speculation and the like development pressure is so intense 
like going there, I really had to shift my mindset around like, it's not clear that anyone, that this land will, could be developed profitably, you know, like even with the Interloop East removal, there was a lot of concern around like that land is just going to sit there vacant because no one lives in downtown Rochester. No one wants to live in downtown Rochester. Like our developers going to want to buy it. <laughs> and so I think, it, yeah, the calculation is very different. And the project is framed very differently in a city that is declining in population. Like that project was sold as an urban development project. Like how do we bring young people back to the center of our city where they can like support local businesses and kind of like do like, it's like an economic development project for the center, center of the city. Um, a highway removal in a place like Dallas is to, has to answer a very different set of questions, which are namely like, how do people get around? How are we going to move all the cars or specifically I mean, the question text asks when they consider that highway removal is like, how are we going to move all the cars we need to move? And like, I, the argument I make in the book is like, the better question is like, how do we move, move all the people we need to move? Um, but like, that is a very different calculation than a place like Rochester. In, in Dallas, the demand is there. There's no question that if they remove that highway and built 25,000 market rate units, people would move into them. No question. But like, that just creates a very different conversation, I think. On the public process piece, again, I think this is a really nice nuance that you capture. I think a few people that you interview kind of almost have like public process fatigue. Uh, there are a few people who are like, well, they've been inviting us to hearings and meetings and workshops for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. And there's this this cynicism that sets in. And I'm wondering if you could just elaborate on that a little bit more. I, I think I think a lot of agencies or lawmakers here okay we need it we didn't do public process in the past let's do more of it but then it becomes this sort of formalized mechanistic thing where okay we're 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 letting you take turns coming up to the mic uh, and speak for two minutes and get mad and then we're shuffling you off and then we're checking the public process box um based on the reporting you did what how would you suggest state departments of transportation to approach that i hadn't thought about that question actually i've just documented how bad it is in texas um, I, I think there's like two kind of parallel problems. One is like, indeed, these projects take so long. And that comes, goes back to NEPA, like all of the requirements TxDOT has to follow under NEPA to advance a project of the scale of the Northeastern Highway Improvement Project, this $10 billion, 28 mile highway expansion. It has been in the works for a very long time. And like, I think been in the works is kind of a loose statement of like, well, it's been in various stages of development of conception. There have been like early public involvement before it was even started the NEPA process. And so I think people like engage and then they lose interest. They also engage and feel like actually what I'm saying is not being taken into account. I mean, I think like part of the way you do authentic public participation is like listen to people and change the project accordingly. Like, again, this is a very different conversation in the housing space of like, that has happened and the effects have been bad in terms of housing creation. But like in transportation, it's like, I think people feel, and I heard from lots of people that they go and they just like ask for something else. And they are just like, they just are speaking to a blank wall that there is just actually nothing that changes due to their participation. And so like, why would you continue giving up your Wednesday evening to go to a public meeting if you feel like your words are not being absorbed, accommodated, or even acknowledged by the people seeking your input. Um, and I saw that a lot at the Texas Transportation Commission that they, you know, they have monthly meetings, people can go give public comment. And it's just really met by this like kind of unflinching silence and like not no very little response. Um, and like it, I chronicle this in the book, but there was a, a public hearing for the, it's called the UTP. It's the Unified Transportation Program, but it's basically how, how the Transportation Commission sets a budget for TxDOT. And they were considering like a $90 billion 10-year uh, budget and about 90 people showed up to testify, mobilized by a lot of these organizers and activists. And the Transportation Commission was like, whoa, this is so many people. This is an unprecedented number of people. We're gonna have to shorten your public comment from three minutes to one minute. Some of those people had traveled from El Paso, which if you don't live in Texas is eight hours from Austin where the Texas Transportation Commission holds its meetings. They don't allow virtual testimony. So people had driven across the state 600 miles to show up and been given one minute to speak on what kind of project. And these were like a county commissioner from El Paso. Okay, these are not, I mean, these are normal people, but they're also like elected representatives had come to the Transportation Commission 
to ask for something else. And like, it was sort of remarkable to just see this like, you know, kind of barrage of testimony of people asking for something else, buses, bike lanes, safer roads, and basically no response from the commissioners. And then before the last person got to their seat, they approved the budget. There was no discussion, you know, even if they were gonna approve the budget, anyway it's like they didn't even discuss the public's concerns so like again i'm just talking about how texas is bad i don't know if i necessarily have a proactive vision of how you do good public engagement like i think smarter people than me policy people are talking about that but it's like at the very least like acknowledge the input you've received um like at the very best it's like change your projects accordingly um but i do think i guess i will say also like a thing I learned through my reporting is I think a lot of times activists and ordinary people focus on state DOTs. They go to TxDOT and they say, TxDOT is the big bad wolf who's gonna widen this highway through my community and I don't want that. But the actual source of the like the political directive that is causing TxDOT to widen this highway is the legislature and like the legislature and the governor. And so if people really wanna get to the root cause of like, why are all these highway widenings happening? it's really the legislature that needs to give a different directive to TxDOT. Um, and I think you've seen in like in blue states, like I just was in Colorado reporting a story about the Colorado DOT. Their governor said, hey, we have really strict emission reduction goals. We want to hit them. Every state agency needs to make a plan to reduce their emissions by 90% by 2050. As a result, CDOT canceled two highway widenings because they were given a very strong directive from their political leaders. You need to do something different. So like, I don't think that state DOTs are necessarily, even in a place like California, like they answer to their state legislature and until the state legislature requests and demands something different, like the status quo will remain. That moment you talk about with the uh, public comment in the book, uh, again, was just kind of one of those amazing scenes. And it, it made me wonder, I mean, you've spent a lot of time with a lot of these anti-freeway activists and a lot of them are, are pretty remarkable individuals. Like I, I was in particular, in particular, really struck by by Molly Cook, who it it seems is just like a total machine, just never sleeps, just does this twenty four seven. And I, I mean, did you ever ask any of them, especially when they when they hit a roadblock or when the uh, Texas Transportation Commission just completely ignored reams of public comment? I mean, how? How do they keep going? How do they not get discouraged? Yeah, it's funny. I actually, someone else asked me that on a podcast and I saw, I was in Houston for a book event. And so I was like seeing all the activists and I was like, hey, can I ask you guys a question? <laughs> How do you keep going when you keep losing? So I've actually re very recently had this conversation and like the answer I got, which I love, is like, we make it fun. So like the staff text at I-45 folks, so a lot of them are like in their late 20s, early 30s. They're like friends. They hang out when they are canvassing. They're also, they like go get a beer afterward or they like have community picnics in a park, which double as a, like an, an organizing moment to collect signatures or something. And that's true of the group in Austin, Rethink 35, Adam Greenfield is the organizer behind that. And his ethos all along has been like, make it fun, make it social. Like people, I think that like a lot of them recognize like one reason people feel frustrated with all these highways is that they like have dispersed us and disconnected us from each other, that we live in our suburban homes or even in the city, it's like, we don't know our neighbors. And so it's like they're, the way I think they're keeping people involved is like by making pe people feel connected to something. And that's true, I think in organizing of any kind is like make people feel connected to a cause. And that is like a much stronger, deeper motivation for action than necessarily winning, right? Like people feeling connected to other people fighting for something has driven a lot of social change, even when those fights were long and even when the defeats were big. So I think what they're doing is like, right, like making it social. And that is hard to do when you're fighting. The thing you're fighting is like antisocial. It's like the, the like the, the primary disconnector of cities. Yeah, I think yeah. at one point you you note that uh, one of the stop text dot I-45 meetings just turned into a pub crawl, uh, which mm -hmm. sounded extremely familiar coming from YMB advocacy. Um, going back to the role of state DOTs, I think, of course, the bulk of the book is about like freeways and freeway widening, but you briefly discuss 
a case in San Antonio where there had been what would probably basically kind of sort of feel like a normal street, maybe a strode, right? A unhappy combination of a street and a road. Um, but it was actually owned by the state DOT. And I think that's a, I don't know if you could expand on that a little bit more. I think most people don't realize that many, many streets, roads, strodes in their community are owned by their state DOT. And there's reasons why they can't change. I know in Kentucky, there was an instance where one of these state highways that was effectively just like a large street through an area of Louisville was having all of these mature trees cut down because they didn't comply with like state highway rules and folks were discovering why does the state own and manage this street at all isn't this this isn't a local street yeah I didn't know that either until I started reporting this book that a lot of kind of ur urban feeling roads that are strodes um, are owned by the state and and the reason they're kind of obvious and innocuous is just like before Austin was so big, a lot of the high, the roads that led out of town, like Lamar, when it went out of Austin, um, Lamar is like a major street that cuts through the city. It like functioned as a highway to get to a rural area. So like, they're kind of like, it kind of makes sense. But what has happened is that states have held on to ownership. And so as cities have tried to do something differently with their city streets in response to demand for bike and pedestrian infrastructure, or even like vision zero mandates, um, they can't, they just are like, uh, their hands are tied. And the most kind of like startling example of this that I've seen is um, the Texas Transportation Commission started turning over, it started a program about a decade ago to like turn some of these state highways over to cities, largely for budget reasons. Like they didn't have enough money to maintain them. And so they were like, hey, cities, please take over maintenance. So one of those was Broadway. You know, it's like a pretty generic strip mall -y, you know, American strode. Um, and so the, the Transportation Commission was like, we're going to give this over to San Antonio. Um, in 2017, the voters of San Antonio as part of a road improvement bond, I think like 72% of voters approved a bond that would narrow that street from six to four lanes and add bike and pedestrian infrastructure and like trees and a bigger sidewalk in its place. And like development followed, Developer, developers saw that, that like, oh, this might be more valuable land. They started, you know, getting rezonings to build higher density office and, and uh apartments. And then one day in early 2022, uh, the agenda for the Texas Transportation Commission meeting was released. And it basically was like had a, a minute order to re to resend ownership of Broadway from the city of San Antonio back to the state. And it turned out that the state had never like maybe signed the document or whatever the like legalese thing giving San Antonio ownership. And um, I was at that meeting. It was absolutely remarkable. Like leaders from San Antonio came up, they were stunned. They were professionally outraged. Um, and they said, you know, like, can you please reconsider? Like we have been, spent years working on this, this so-called road diet. Um, you don't say road diet in Texas though, because people don't like that. Um, this road improvement. Um, you know, we, we would like to proceed. Like the voters of San Antonio approved this measure. And so the, a bunch of people testified and then Bruce Bug, Jay Bruce Bug, our, our villain from earlier, you know, he's like, I think we should, I should offer some like this, some explanation for why we're going to do this. And he basically lays out like the fact that Governor Abbott has given the Transportation Commission one directive and that directive is to fix congestion in Texas cities. And so reducing car capacity in a major thoroughfare in a Texas city would run counter to that directive. And therefore, like they need to take it back and the city of San Antonio cannot reduce the lanes on that street which is really remarkable for one is like does governor Abbott not have better things to do with his time but apparently you know like i think the speculation was and no one has ever been able to prove this is that like governor Abbott like intervened he called bruce bug and my my reason to speculate that is i looked up where bruce bug lives in the property county or the property uh, district and he lives like three blocks from broadway so he has been on that street he has traveled on it. He has seen the cranes going up, the construction. Like, there's no way he was unaware of that. Um, so anyway, he basically takes back control. Um, and it was like a little bit, like it caused a little bit of a, like a scandal in the Texas transportation world. And a few months later, that, that fall, there was a, like a policy conference in Austin, the Texas Tribune Festival. And a reporter at the Texas Tribune asked a higher up at TxDOT, who was there representing the agency, you know, like, hey, what happened? And he said this thing, which is like, it's, it's like burned into my brain because it was so remarkable. He was like, you know, we understand. So part of the, the road measure was to make this street safer. People are getting in crashes a lot. Bikes, it's dangerous for bicyclists and pedestrians. So that was part of the, the effort is like, let's make this street safer. 
And he said, we understand the need to make our city streets safer, but not at the expense of vehicular capacity. That it's, is it's remarkable. Yeah. That is almost like a, a a summary of the entire city transportation plan or credo. I mean, that's like their Hippocratic mm -hmm. oath. It's really, it's really incredible. I mean, something that this conversation gets to, I think, is is something you point out in your book, which is that there's this there's a sort of ideological undercurrent in the way that it it seems people think about this stuff, which is that in Planning planning uh, for public transit is somehow a socialist activity. You're uh, putting a bunch of people together and making them share this common good. You're subsidizing it with public funds. But I mean, this this story is really illustrative of the fact that it seems like nothing in Texas, I mean, except for maybe their like anti-choice laws involves more centralized planning and state control over local decision making than the than the transportation system it's re it's really remarkable just how much public subsidy and how much sort of top down central planning seems to go into the creation and and maintenance of the texas highway system yeah absolutely i mean i've sat so the um one fun fact about transportation in texas is that our state constitution requires that 97% of the state highway fund is spent on roads. So like you, you would have to change the state constitution to allow the state to fund transit. So as a result, TxDOT does some very, very small rural transit programs, but it doesn't spend any money in Texas cities. And so most sessions, you know, activists try to change that. They file a bill to say, let's open up the state highway trust fund for other modes. And I, there was a hearing in, I think it was 2021 that I went to, and, you know, I sat there and listened as, as person after person, you know, like, and people who were opposed the measure for opening up the highway trust fund said exactly that, you know, highways are good free market capitalism and transit is for socialists, that we are subsidizing transit riders by spending public money on it. And you know, anyone listening to this podcast probably knows we spend billions and billions of dollars subsidizing car travel every year in the U.S. and have since 1956. And so the idea that it is somehow independent of like it's just free market, you know, there's no government intervention is pretty ludicrous. Um, but I think, you know, it's like there is some some connection, which is like when you're on transit, you do have to interact with other people um, when you don't in your car. Like you simply don't. You have total autonomy. Uh, over like where you're going and when you want to go there. I mean, I think that like, and so the, the the way that it's sold is freedom is like you have autonomy over your own travel and you don't really like, then I mean, no one says you don't have to interact with other people, but it gives you this like independence, which like, frankly, I have waited for the bus for 35 minutes in Austin. Like, I don't feel very independent when I'm waiting for the bus <laughs> that long. Um, so like part of it is like, it's a self-perpetuating cycle as our transit systems become worse driving just as consistently a more free, better alternative. But, you know, the converse of that is like, nor do I feel very free when I'm sitting on I-35 in rush hour traffic, when I am like, rely on my car to get absolutely everywhere I need to go in Austin. Like I would love to drive less in the city, but like, it's just not, it's not practical. Um, but indeed like the, the, I don't know, I don't have a good answer for that, except it absolutely drives me nuts. And I have witnessed congressional hearings where I've heard that talking point of like, transit is for socialists like that that goes from this like the lowest levels of government all the way up to congress when they were considering the bipartisan infrastructure bill of like how do they allocate funding you had people in congressional hearings saying transit is for socialists and we don't want to subsidize transit riders and no one is maybe factoring in how deeply we subsidize car owners i feel very free when i'm sitting in traffic on the 10 <laughs> uh, and it takes me 45 <laughs> minutes to get across the city um no yeah i this is an important point i think yeah i think people People have this idea of, oh, okay, like um, our roads are paid for by user fees. We all pay gas taxes. Of course, you you highlight in the book that like doesn't even come close to funding what we actually spend on roads. And I think a broader issue is that as we transition to uh, EVs, you know, a lot of benefits there doesn't solve everything. But uh, one cost is well, gas tax revenue is falling, and the way we finance roads is one just getting to be less fiscally sustainable, and two, it's becoming more regressive. Um, there's a lot of conversations about transitioning over to vehicle miles, travel tax, um, here in LA, there are big conversations around congestion pricing. 
Is there any conversation like that happening in Texas? And, you know, I'm, I'm curious, like in these contexts, like whatever somebody proposes to expand a freeway, I'm always like, well, did you even try to do like congestion pricing before this? And I'm curious if there was any conversation about that in Texas or any of the other states you've reported on. Not, there's no conversation about congestion pricing in Texas. We operate in a, and I'm quoting Governor Harbert, but anti-toll environment. So tolling is seen as a tax and we don't add, we don't like taxes in Texas. So there's basically no congestion pricing, like even as an option in Texas, particularly on like on state highways. Um, there is actually, Texas is considering a user fee as a, a way to replace the gas tax. There's like, it's like a pilot program to look at how do you maybe uh, raise transportation money absent the gas tax. Um, but I think it's this like kind of remarkable opportunity as EVs come into the market to like rethink how we finance transportation. The Highway Trust Fund was created in 1956 to pay for the Interstate Highway Program. Indeed, just what you said, Nolan, like through user fees. And that was Eisenhower's big push was like, this should be self-sustaining, which is to say users of the uh, the asset will pay for the asset. And that is through the gas tax. And so when in 1956, Congress, when it passed the Interstate Highway Act, Congress created the Highway Trust Fund, which was funded by the gas tax. Um, and, and that has like, that it was supposed to expire in the 1970s when the Interstate Highway Program was built out. But, you know, you might imagine that the road builders and the, the car companies didn't want that dedicated funding to disappear. And so it remains. Um, and we spend, you know, roughly 80% of the Highway Trust Fund on car infrastructure. Um, and so my like kind of the policy argument in my book is we should get rid of the highway trust fund. And I don't know that that's like quite in the mainstream yet, but like I, that was one of my hopes for the, the book is to like bring that idea forward, which is like, this is a, some there I quote a Senator from the 1970s who says, this is a transportation financing system designed for a time long past. Like if that was true in the 1970s, it's absolutely true today. Like the highway trust fund was, was built to facilitate interstate travel. Like we did it, we built it out. And you can now get from LA to New York on the interstate highway very seamlessly. Um, we should think about how do we fund transportation to like support the priorities and values of 2024. That's one of the things that I think really comes through in your book, but just also looking at any department of transportation is just, it seems like there is such overpowering institutional and bureaucratic inertia when it comes to when it comes to expanding the uh, freeways and and just the you know the way transportation departments operate and i i know that um you didn't get a whole lot of access to the uh, texas transportation commission when you were working on the book and that you were mostly focused on um you know on on the people who were actually affected by the freeway expansion or who were fighting it but I'm curious if you if you took anything away from your research about sort of the the composition of TxDOT and maybe some of the some of the things that institutionally just other than the sort of top down political pressure, if there are other factors within the institution that make it very very difficult for them to change course, because I can tell you that in in California and I think this is probably true in a lot of other transportation departments. Part of the part of the issue is just that. The transportation departments are staffed by traffic engineers. There are way more traffic engineers than there are transportation planners. And when you have an entire staff of traffic engineers, then the, you know, the the sort of mindset is always going to be how do we how do we reduce congestion? How do we get more more lanes on this highway? Um, so yeah, could you, you just talk a little bit maybe about what tech stop looks like on the inside? Yeah, I mean, it's totally the class. Like, if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Like, that is absolutely how state DOTs work, because they're all trained to move cars and accommodate car travel. And, like, there's just not that higher level thinking about, like, well, is that desirable? And, like, I learned this from Beth Osborne at Transportation for America, but she sort of, like, has this wonderful rant that she does about how we've, like, abdicated policy decisions to engineers. Like, if you have a street going through your city, like whether or not you want that street to be wider depends on your policy objectives for the city. And yet we have engineers who are saying, hey, we're gonna fix traffic for this street in your city, this highway. Um, and therefore like to, to accommodate the number of cars, we're gonna build it this wide. But like the policy question is like, do we want to accommodate the number of cars? Like, do we want to encourage through our policy other modes of travel? And yet because engineers have all the power, like they get to say, well, the number says there are gonna be this number of cars, so therefore we have to build it that wide. 
ignoring the question of whether or not that's desirable. Um, so that's, again, that's like, I don't wanna take credit for that idea, but I think that's like a helpful way to think about it for me is like, right, the, the people who are making the decisions are trained to see this, to answer this problem in only one way. Like the question, like they need a different question to answer. Um, I will say I did, I got very little access to TxDOT. Um, so I, the Dallas district was like the most open with me and I, you know, I really appreciated their transparency. Um, but the huge, so they're, so they're all in districts and they operate kind of as like fiefdoms. They're pretty separate. And so there's a district engineer in Austin and Houston and Dallas. Um, Dallas Houston was under like active litigation through, because Harris County sued <laughs> uh, TxDOT over the Northeast and how improvement project. So they didn't talk to me the entire time. Um, da Austin didn't talk to me. I, I did like a background interview, um, but I got no access to them either. What I've heard from, so I, so I, I, I can't speak authoritatively on like the composition of TxDOT. I have heard from people that like, there are people at TxDOT who absolutely understand that building wider highways doesn't fix congestion. Like the former executive director, James Bass said so in like a webinar, like as Texas continues to grow, we're gonna need to consider investing in other modes. So like he's saying that on the record, people who work there are like young people who live in Austin who see I-35 and how poorly it functions and like understand the need to invest in other modes, but like they just are not empowered. I think that's true at a place like Caltrans with Jeannie Worldwaller, the whistleblower who like talked about Caltrans widening highways using funding that was not supposed to be spent on widening highways. Like there are certainly people within DOTs who understand the problem and understand that it requires a different set of solutions than just widening highways, but they're not like being empowered, I think. And, and I get, I think it just gets back to this like, yeah, they, these organizations run by engineers, there's like a pretty strong inertia in that profession and that discipline of, we got to, you know, the number says they're going to be this many cars, we got to build for this many cars. Um, so I, I think you have to begin to staff DOTs differently. Uh, right. I mean, there's a, there's a classic blog post. I can't remember who wrote it uh, in the last few years. Uh, part of it starts in civil engineering school, right? We don't train transportation engineers. We train highway engineers and everything's optimized around throughput. Um, but um, I, if I know if, if transportation planning is anything like city planning, I suspect there are a lot of people within TxDOT reading your book, cheering you on. So <laughs> I hope are so, probably man. more junior. <laughs> um, uh, a couple other things from my notes here. One, can your next book be on uh, preschool standards? You tell a story of a preschool <laughs> that's being displaced by I think I-45 in Houston, uh, was it? And, I-35 um, in Austin. Uh, excuse me, I-35 in Austin, yeah. Uh, and they can't find another place just because preschool. I, I, as somebody attuned to like, increasingly attuned to uh, child care costs, uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's another, that's a rabbit hole. I almost wish there was a little footnote on. Um, uh, but uh, in all seriousness, um, I'm curious um, to, to hear, what did you change your mind on over the course of reporting the book? I think uh, while you chew on that, I'll say while I was reading it, I think, I th I think I gained a little bit more of an appreciation for other things that have to happen concurrent to freeway removal. Your intuition is correct that I think, uh, uh, speaking for Ned and I, yeah, I think we probably both are very pro freeway removal. But I think I I didn't fully realize, I think that some of these broader changes that have to, like you really do have to have it associated with changes in where we build housing. You really do have to have it associated with transit investment. And I think I knew that on some level, but your your book, I think, really, really, really reinforced it and helped me to empathize with people who might be in a very different situation with respect to their freeway. And that might be their ticket to opportunity, or that might be their ticket to affordable housing that I hadn't fully considered. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. Of like, I mean, I got into writing this book because I was covering housing in Austin and sprawl and like our land development code that doesn't allow housing to be built in the city. And then four months later, after I published this big story, TxDOT allocated $4 million to expand I-35. And I was like, those are the same story. Like those are absolutely the same story of our housing policy, reinforcing bad transportation policy. Um, but to your question around what I changed my mind on, I mean, I think I, I touched a little bit about it earlier. Like I was really struck and tried very hard to like check my own biases, talking to a lot of people who didn't want highways to be removed for like very good reason that like people, in a place like South Dallas who rely on highways to get everywhere they need to go and just don't really see the city doing anything to proactively help their neighborhood build prosperity. Um, and so like, I really worked hard to like incorporate that in the book of like, I think that perspective like deserves its own 
like voice unqualified, you know, like I have reasons why I'm like, well, and lots of urban planners are like, well, there's a counter argument. And I'm like, well, I really did want to like, just present that as its own perspective of the people who rely on highways. Um, you know, there, I, I interviewed this like kind of middle class family who lives in Kyle, which is a suburb South of Austin. And, um, the wife commutes to Austin every day and she's like, would love a train. She would love a train to get her there. And the husband's kind of like, yeah, I'd like, a, I'd like another lane on this highway. <laughs> and like, I really like, what I wanted to do was present an, a very strong argument for moving away from car dependency and getting rid of these three ways. But like, I think there are compelling reasons to keep them. And I wanted to present the perspective of people who feel that way and not have kind of my voice or my argument be part of their narrative. Uh, yeah, I, I, there were a few moments in the book where you're reporting somebody saying something and I'm like, oh, I totally disagree with what this person is saying. What kind of narrative is Megan pushing here? And then I, I step back and I'm like, oh, she's just doing good journalism and revealing, I think, the range of views that people have on this topic that like you kind of have to contend with. So I, I really appreciated that actually. Yeah, I didn't want to write an urban planning book, you know, like I wanted to write a book about people and people have really, you know, it's like, there are lots of different ways to think about car dependency. Um, and I wanted to like try to at least present some range of those views. Well, and I think I think another aspect of the book, I mean, we, we talk about the policy, right? I think it, because at least Ned and I are nerds and I suspect you're a little bit of a nerd as well. But I mean, the heart and soul of the book is is all of these people who are living normal, fully realized lives. And for the activists, right? Like removing the freeway really is kind of their mission. But um, the book really effectively shows like how the freeway is sort of like a factor in a lot of people's lives who, you know, like the, 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 the lady who returns from Iraq and builds her dream home in her hometown. Right. Or the, 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 the family running a daycare center. Right. Like th th this is not their, their entire lives. And it's almost frustrating to see the extent to which like they have other cool, like dreams and ambitions and goals. And like this freeway is just coming these, these freeway expansion proposals are just kind of coming in and like, and they're like, I don't want to think about this stuff. Like I, I want to like, <laughs> you know, continue with what I was doing. And I feel like it actually is, is, is well captured just how like these, these, the, you know, uh, right. Take an interest in politics or politics will take an interest in you. Right. People are kind of dragged into these mm -hmm. fights that they had no interest in previously. Yeah. The preschool, you mentioned it earlier, but that was like one of the most moving things for me that I reported. So it's like a, it's a Spanish immersion preschool right on the I-35 frontage road. They've already been displaced once from downtown Austin when kind of real, as part of the real estate boom of downtown Austin, they got displaced when their site was turned into a hotel. And they found this kind of unassuming limestone brick building on the I-35 frontage road and have occupied it for two decades. And like, right, like running a childcare center is already hard enough, right? There's like a lot of state regulation that you mentioned. It's, it's a sort of famously low profit industry, like childcare centers, hundreds of child care centers closed during the pandemic because they just couldn't make ends meet. And it's like child care is essential to a family's functioning. Like p parents can't work without child care. And it's like good child care, right? Like where you, where parents feel like their children are getting educated and cared for well and learning another language. And so I spent a day literally just um, sitting on a tiny chair in the back of a classroom, one of these, uh, and just like observing the daily rhythms of like a, you know, four-year-old, five-year-olds in their classroom. And it was like, so you get so immersed in this world and it's like, you know, the, all the little, the like games they play and the art projects they do. And it's such a like complete world. And then like the parents start arriving and you're just reminded of this like rush that exists as grownups. Like we all, I'm sure have experiences of just like, I gotta get home, I gotta get dinner on the table. And that rush is like, you know, there's just this highway right there. And it's easy to forget it when you're in this little world, you know, like drawing pictures of like school buses and ladybugs. And like, and yet there is this highway that's really like literally overhead impacting these kids' lives and the lives of their parents, namely, who like, you know, rely on this place every day that at like the ease of access to it. And it's gonna like, for, for most of the time I was reporting the book that people who own this place, like didn't know if they could continue. They didn't know if they could find another place to continue their school. And it's like, that was just like very moving to me because it's like, it's so far out. It's like not, not anything related to transportation policy. It's just this like fundamental question of like, how are we caring for our kids and what kind of future are we leaving for them? Yeah, I have a, I have another craft question on that point because one of the things 
that really struck me about your book reading it and made me honestly a little um a little in awe and also a little jealous as a as a former reporter myself was just it really did seem like you found for each different kind of aspect or angle of the way in which freeways were affecting people it's like you found the best possible source the best possible personal narrative to track uh i mean you know the preschool uh, some of the some of the incredible activists you spoke to, uh, modesty, the the woman who returned from Iraq and, and built her dream home. Uh, I mean, so my my question is really just how did you how did you find all these people and how did you? I mean, I'm sure you must have talked to hundreds of people. So how how did you make decisions about uh, this is this is the person whose story is going to bear this particular angle? Thank you for asking that because that was absolutely the hardest part about this book um, is that like I was writing about three freeway projects that basically exist in PDF documents like they nothing has changed about those highways there is basically no action to cover in, as it relates to those highways they're just like big bureaucratic projects that are moving extremely slowly and I had to create like a dynamic narrative out of that. Um, I don't know if I have a good answer except that I talked to an enormous number of people. Um, I talked to a lot of people that didn't make it into the book and a lot of why sometimes people didn't make it into the book is like, sometimes people don't think they are impacted by highways. Like they just don't have that much to say, even if they're going to get displaced. I mean, mostly people who got displaced had something to say about it, but like, sometimes it was just sort of, it wasn't that deep. You know, there wasn't that much like complexity to their feelings about it. Like some people are just like, I don't like my commute. And you're like, well, tell me more. And they don't have that much more to say about it. You know, so I think I like I did a lot of kind of testing of, of folks to see who was like dynamic and kind of could think critically and kind of bounce off my thoughts around this. Um, but like, you know, Escuelita, that school I just mentioned, like I didn't actually get access to them until like, uh, you know, six months before my book deadline. So a lot of it, like I spent a lot of the years stressing about finding those people and narratives. Um, some of them, I will say, like became more meaningful as things happened, which like, um, so for example, I interviewed this woman, Rebecca Weinbar, who's a, like a white woman in her thirties who rented a, a an apartment with her boyfriend and like a, you know, a, a market rate, uh, apartment complex near downtown Houston. And they found out that they were going to, they got displaced by the expansion. And so they got like a pretty generous relocation. They moved, they were able to like save that relocation money to potentially use as a down payment for a house. And so I talked to her and I was like, hmm, well, it doesn't seem like that seems like they were treated fairly. I don't have, I don't know if that's interesting, but I did that interview. I stayed in touch with her. Um, and then like six months after I talked to her and I had kind of thrown her story aside, um, the, can, the tech staff began demolishing her former apartment complex lost at the ballpark. And this was when that pro the project had been paused by the federal government. So FHWA paused the project while they investigated civil rights concerns. And they were very clear, like no action should be taken on this project. Well, Texas had already bought these buildings, so they already owned them. So it's like a little bit of a gray area, like could they actually proceed with demolition? Activists would stop Texas I-45, saw that construction was beginning somewhat unannounced. And they found out that Texas intended to tear down all three buildings. So it was like, it's like a three, three, uh, big kind of square buildings. And only the front one is in the footprint of the expansion. And in the environmental documentation for the project, Texas had only accounted for the demolition of housing units of the front one. And the, the volunteer found out just by calling the construction company, the demolition company, um, that Texas intended to plant, tear down all three, which is like mm -hmm. a violation of its environmental documentation. <laughs> um, and so they alerted FHWA, FHW intervened, they had this big protest. It was this like kind of big flashpoint in the story of this highway expansion. The mayor got involved. It made TxDOT look really bad. <laughs> like the mayor was like kind of shame on you TxDOT for, you know, we're in the midst of a housing crisis and you're taking more housing than you need. And as a result of the Stop TxDOT protest, they were able to save the back two buildings from demolition. And um, I think now they're kind of in discussion around, the city is in discussion around turning them into permanent supportive housing. But like suddenly then that conversation I had with that woman like, like became super, like a, a nice narrative thread to follow because there was this protest that happened. 
similarly, like I talked to a, a woman who lived in public housing and I, it was only kind of after I, like a couple months after I talked to her that I was like, oh, the public housing complex where she's getting displaced from is like two blocks from where Rebecca lives. This is a black woman who lives in public housing. Rebecca is a white woman, they're about the same age and they are treated very differently in the process. Like the woman who lives in public housing is given a section eight voucher and said basically like, good luck. Um, and it takes her a long time to find housing. She has to move really far out from her son and daughter's school. She has to drive everywhere she needs to go. So it was kind of like, this is a long way of saying like, I kind of had this realization. I was like, oh, those three could be braided together in a way of like, it literally happens within like, you know, six blocks of each other in downtown Houston. Like thinking about how this woman, Jasmine, who lives in public housing was treated compared to someone who lives three blocks away who happens to live in market rate housing both of their units are getting demolished and one is given a lot more resources to rebuild her life. Um, and that, I think like then that you have a little bit of a narrative, you have like change over time, you have conflict with the protest. Um, but I will say like, I wanted, I initially wanted to write like a kind of classic, a few character focused book. And I quickly realized like, I really had to talk, I had to weave together a lot of different narratives to kind of capture the kaleidoscopic nature of like one person's story just doesn't capture, right? Like highways impact people in so many different ways. These highway expansions are also really, each one is different and in a different stage. But that was like, that, like writing the book was really, uh, like I had like, you know, post-it notes all over my office, like a crazy person. Like it was really hard to figure out how to weave all of those together in a way that didn't feel chaotic and confusing. Um, so thank you for saying that because it was extremely difficult. <laughs> yeah. So, so how did you approach the writing? And I, I promise this will be the, for the listeners at home who don't care about this, I promise this will be the last craft question, but I mean, how did you approach the writing? Because you are weaving not, not just all these dozens of personal stories, but also, um, yeah, the, the chapters kind of, uh, rotate between talking about the three different cities and then sometimes moving to Rochester or to DC. And so I imagine that's the kind of thing that you can't just, you can't just sit down and write it sequentially because it's all, it, it's kind of all different compartments of your notes and sort of different parts of your brain. So, I mean, how did you, how did you just kind of stay organized around that and, and decide how to sequence things? Yeah, this is like really going to get it for the writing nerds out there. Um, so I use I use Scrivener, which is like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It's a word, it's, it's, a, it's a platform for organizing and writing, but it actually is like, I, I don't know if I could have done it without Scrivener. I'm like a real Scrivener stan. Um, but it basically allows you to like include your research documents. You have like a side pane where you can like see different documents. It like makes the whole thing much more visual. Um, and it also allows you to like pull like what I did was I ha I started writing little sections. So it was like, I, I wrote a section about modesty. I wrote a section about, like I wrote just like chunks of the book, like 2000 word chunks. And I could, and I labeled them and I could kind of see them. So I, I wrote probably half of the book before I had any structure. Like I just sort of was writing and then it was like, oh, I could see how they were in conversation with each other. Oh, could they be in the same chapter? But I had like, you know, anecdotes or bits of research that just existed as like little documents in my Scrivener file. Um, and I'm like, I, I'm like a very much a visual thinker. So it was helpful for me to be like, um, just kind of see, see what I had already. And I did decide at some point to like split the book into three parts. And that was helpful for me too, of like, okay, this is going to go in the first third. This is going to go in the second third. This is going to go in the final third. Just like three act structures, a classic structure. Let's try to do that beginning, middle, and end. And that's going to force me to think about how, how I have some movement over the book that there's like, you know, narrative tension building throughout. Um, and I really just did that by like putting files in their, in their buckets. But the way that I like handled having all these characters was by just having like, I wrote a bunch about modesty. I wrote a bunch about Jasmine. I had their stories written and then I like braided them together into like a, a longer manuscript. But it was very much like ignore, what is the phrase? Like ignoring the forest for the trees, like just building trees and then trying to kind of combine them. Yeah, if you can't tell Ned's working on his book. <laughs> 
which I've been <laughs> pushing hard on him lately. Uh, so, um, yeah, Andy, good we want to we want to do a quick uh, lightning round here. Great. Uh, so, Megan, what is the best taco in Austin? Toscana. Do you good. want to say more, or is this like one word lightning round? <laughs> you can say more, or we can move on. <laughs> Piscata is a food truck in East Austin, and they have one kind of taco, and it is the best taco in Austin. All right, another Austin question. So, Austin's a big live music town. Where's the Where's the best place to catch some live music? Oh, I'm gonna say Stubbs. Still my favorite venue. You can, it's like kind of like the answer now is like, well, how much money do you have? <laughs> but if you're like mid range, Stubbs is the place to go. Okay. Uh, you, you're, you're, you're dictator of transportation policy for Texas for a day. You can remove one stretch of urban freeway in Texas. What's gone? Well, I live a mile from I 35, so I'm going to be selfish and I'm going to remove the stretch that starts at South Austin, at Ben White, and it goes to 290. I just want that gone because it would benefit me in my life greatly. <laughs> If you could have any city's transportation network just grafted onto Austin, which would it be? be foreign or domestic? Can be either. No. Uh, I've never been to Paris, but I see a lot of people overlay Paris transit networks onto different cities. So I'm just going to go with like the, the Twitter intelligentsia and say that. <laughs> uh, you spent a lot of time in Dallas and Houston. Um, uh, favorite neighborhood in both cities? Mm, I spent a lot of time reporting in the Fifth Ward in Houston, and it's underrated. It's not a neighborhood I would like send. It's not a tourist neighborhood, but like I got invited into people's homes. I met so many cool people. There's awesome barbecue at the Nickel City, Nickel Sandwich Grill. Great barbecue. Dallas. Um, Bishop Arts in Dallas. I'm spending a lot of time in Dallas because my partner has a lot of family there. And I actually think Dallas is overall a really underrated city. Um, you know, I feel like there's a lot of buzz around Austin. I kind of, I had a little bit of a weird affection for Houston because of the non-zoning thing. Um, but, uh, you know, Dallas, I think people talk about it like it's a kind of just big corporate office park. But I think it's actually a lot more interesting and dynamic of a city, I think, than maybe a lot of folks who, especially on the urbanist track, I think, had considered. And I think that it actually comes through in your book that there actually are a lot of people in Dallas who are are really trying to build a better Dallas and already embracing some of what's great about it. Um, yeah, it's an unlikely place for a highway removal conversation to have taken hold in Texas, but indeed, like they have gotten farther than any other city in like considering that idea. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think really comes through in your book is that it this is not necessarily the way I think anyone thinks about Texas, but it is a very urban state. I mean, there are a lot of very rural areas, but I mean, Dallas, San Antonio, Houston, Austin, I mean, those are all big cities. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and our state politics does not reflect that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've always appreciated your reporting and this book was fantastic. I'm curious, what's next for you? What's interesting to you going forward? A book is such a huge thing. I'm sure you're, I hope you're taking at least somewhat of a break uh, and enjoying uh, folks engaging with your work so far, but what uh, as any good writer, I'm sure you're already thinking about what's next. So what's next? I don't know. I mean, I am a, a full-time freelancer, so I'm, I write magazine stories. I write a lot for Bloomberg City Lab and Texas Monthly, and I have a story coming out in the New York Times about the Colorado Department of Transportation. So I'm kind of just still, I'm still covering transportation. I, I'm like, I don't feel exhausted. Um, I don't feel like I, I feel like I have now expertise that I can actually find really interesting stories and don't have to do all of this learning about like, what is NEPA and how does it work? Um, so covering, still covering transportation. I mean, I got into this because I was a housing reporter. So I've been, I'm really interested in covering housing. I'm working on a story right now for Texas Monthly about the like statewide effort at zoning reform in Texas, which is bringing together like very unlikely political allies. I wrote a story, but I'm also like, I'm, my MO as a reporter is I like love to learn. And so as soon as I feel like I'm done learning about something, I'm gone. Um, and I actually just reported a story for Texas Monthly about groundwater, and I'm now suddenly like absolutely fascinated by groundwater. Um, so expect more on a water beat. <laughs> awesome. Well, Megan, thanks so much. Uh, again, the book, City Limits, Infrastructure Inequality, and the Future of America's Highways. Uh, I loved it. Uh, I know it's kind of trite, but I couldn't put it down. 
I was really enjoying it. I was totally engaged with the characters. And this is definitely a book that I want to get on the desk of every transportation commissioner. So thanks for writing it. And thanks for joining the Abundance Podcast. Oh, it was so fun to be here and talk with you too. Thank you for having me.